So this is quite an honor. I am actually quite speechless, and I was laughing today. My husband was laughing at me because I was far more nervous about this than the lung transplant we were doing, and he said, think what you just said. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. Um, this is actually quite an honor, and I very much believe in this cause. I have two daughters, and I'm working very hard. I have one who wants to be a physicist, and I'm rooting for her every day. <laughs> so um, I, I, I'm going to talk about a bunch of different things here, um, and, and I'm hoping that you can kind of, uh, I, I'm not talking about neutrinos. I have no idea what those are. Somebody said you talked about that. So you guys can relax a little bit. There's nothing hard here. I'm not that smart. So if you look at this book title, it's called Life Would Be Perfect If I Lived in That House. And I, and I really like this title because I think just like having someone come up and talk to you who's made it, I think it somehow implies that if you just look around a little bit, you kind of do these three things. You buy the house, you buy the car, and you, you know, check the box that you have a spouse or whatever, and pick up a couple kids at the grocery store, you'll have this perfect life. And the reality is it doesn't work that way. It really doesn't work that way. So there's nothing I can tell you that's a road map for how you do one thing or another. Everybody's life is going to be different, and there's no such thing as a perfect life. Some look better from the street. That is true. <laughs> but there's nothing about a perfect life, OK? You got, everyone has things they have to work around. Everyone's had choices that they've had to make. There are people you've met for better or for worse, but have changed your life forever. And those are the things that really go into how do you put this all together. And I think that's important for us to tell girls as we're talking about careers in science, it's not going to be perfect. The laundry doesn't get done some days. <laughs> and that's OK. My family, you'll hear a little bit about, we built two houses from the ground up, plumbing, brickwork, shingles. We did all of it. And what you learn in experiences like that is it has to do with building materials, location, opportunities, and some of the choices that you make on the way as to what you want your house to be and how you build it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that because it's really the same when you build your life. So as we go through this talk, rather than think about look what her life is now. What I really want to do is think about what's the foundation? What are the events and tools that made a girl come from rural Minnesota on a farm, from an unaccredited high school, I might add, which I found out when I went to make college applications, <laughs> to become an engineer, go on to medical school, get a PhD in immunology, do actually get NIH funding and do research, and then show up at Harvard, going to be their first woman cardiothoracic surgery resident, also, which I found out after the fact, <laughs> at, at Brigham. And you, and, you, and you do that, and you think, what were you thinking? And in fact, my department chair asked me one day, what were you thinking? <laughs> and I was like, well, clearly I wasn't, but it worked, and, and, and that's fine. So it's not like you're on the farm lifting bales and decide, I think I'll go do lung transplants at Brigham. I mean, it eventually happens, but it's not what you think. And so it's really thinking as we talk about how to mentor, what are the things that made that event happen? What made it work? Okay? And how can we do that? The last thing is nobody's house is going to look like mine. No one's, your idea of a perfect house will be different than my perfect house, which is different than my daughter's perfect house. Everyone starts in a different place with different tools. And so none of this is a road map, as I said. It really is, what are the things that have to go into it? Where are the places you can add the spark? Where are the turning points that make the decision that somebody decides not to do physics or does decide to do physics? And that's where we have to capture people, because it's little things. We can talk about the big programs. It's the one teacher who says something to you that says you can do it. And that's what we have to get. Okay. So a little bit about how I built my house, so to speak. So everyone says you need to have a good foundation. As I've hinted to, farm life in an unaccredited high school probably isn't what you had in mind. Okay? <laughs> but I learned some really important things that are fundamentally important. I learned about hard work and work hard. And those are different, but they're critically important. On a farm, everybody has to work if you're four years old or you're 84 years old. 
You work what you can do, and it has to be to be successful. And nobody works like you do on the farm. I mean, I still can't keep up with my mom. You can, if you, you can do anything if you work hard enough, and you have to learn to persevere. Farmers learn how to persevere. You can't make the crops grow any faster. You can't make the rain stop raining. You got you to gotta figure it out. And sometimes you really just have to figure it out yourself. How are you going to make it successful or not? And it's something that I think we don't like people to struggle, and we don't like people to figure out how to do it, but there's an element in perseverance that we really need to build in our young women so they don't quit the first time the experiment doesn't work. And then you have to have that gift of community, and that's how you can get through perseverance. You have to have love and respect and gift of a family um, that holds together in a good community. Everybody plays a role in making that dream happen. And you belong if you move away. You can't really, get, you can't really leave the farm. And my brother <laughs> sent me this cartoon because he thinks Harvard is a foreign planet. <laughs> and he said, you may leave, but you can't. And so I don't know how he found this cartoon, because there's not that many people with the name Yolanda. And it has these two astronauts that says, no, I wouldn't exactly say it's a sign of higher intelligence. <laughs> so he says, you can go away, but you can't really leave. So the first thing you really have to do is decide what kind of house it is that you're going to buy, you're going to build. So your life, if you want a houseboat or you want a castle, you have to choose. You can't substitute one for the other and they don't work well. It's a completely different need. So we have to get people to understand they're going to have to make choices, and you have to decide what kind of house. So how do you decide that? You really have to decide what it is your purpose is and what your passion is. And that's the most important thing, because you get different tools if you go one way or the other that you need for the purpose. But my purpose was I had this need that I had to help people. I had to do something to change their life. A lot of varieties of ways to do that, but that's what drives me, okay? So medicine is great for me. It's easy. There's lots of things I can do, all right? But what I find every day is I have to remember my purpose, what it is that I'm really in this for, and who I work for. And you can't tell them, but it's not the hospital administrator, all right? <laughs> I'm working for the person in the operating room. I'm with the person in the clinic. I'm working for Mrs. Jones. I'm working for that person. And every day, you've got to remind yourself of that, because that's why I'm there. And that instilling that purpose is really what we need to do to women as they go through their career, be it, medicine, be it science or not. But I think they have so much more potential in science. And we just have to, have to let them know that. And then passion comes from my dad, who's a dreamer. So my mom gets the work. My dad is the dreamer. And it was a really great combination for me. And, and so you can change your part of the world. And to me, science is a great way to be able to do that. Okay. So since I kind of had an idea what I needed to do, I had to get the right tools. So I chose an engineering undergraduate. And it was ideal for me. Okay. It let me understand the world. It let me figure out how I could change the world. And it's very practical. I grew up on a farm, right? Neutrinos don't, that's great for some people, but it doesn't work for me. So very practical solutions to real problems. Okay, What is it that I can do? That's how I think. That's who I am. And that works for me. I then added on medicine because I needed the purpose part of this. So I get medicine, a PhD in immunology. I start to look at transplant. I do a postdoc. We start to really see how we can change what we do. And it fills purpose for me. So then I have all these different things. And I've done research in all these different areas, which have been very active parts of research. So we've worked on endothelial cells and lymphocytes, tolerance, stem cells, a no numerous number of things. And then today I'm going to talk kind of how it's evolved into polymers and nanoparticles and cancers and things like that. But you don't want to make everyone think they have one pathway. You can move lots of directions. It's not like you choose one thing forever. And the idea of making people think that they have one thing, if it doesn't work out, they're done, is wrong. It will change. But the purpose stays the same. That's what stays the same. Then I was really fortunate when I went to medical school. And I was telling people at the table really quickly how I'm in medical school, first day of medical school. I don't know anything. I'm the farm kid, you know? 
And, and I had seen this lecture, and they were talking about transplant, and someone told me I should call this surgeon. So of all things, the little farm girl from Minnesota calls up this cardiothoracic surgeon, who I don't, I'm not smart enough to realize they don't like women yet. And I call the guy up, and I say, um, hey, I really would like to come talk to you about this, because I think I might like this heart transplant thing. Right? I'm, one day in medical school, I'm going to do heart transplant. <laughs> And so he says to me, he says, what's your undergrad? I go engineering. He says, I expect you here in 10 minutes. That made all the difference in the world that this guy, guy, you know, cardiothoracic surgeons don't like women, said, you're over here in 10 minutes. Up until, I think he's like 85 now. He calls me every six months and says, so what are you doing? Is there anything I can do to help you? Those are the people you got to connect to. Okay? If I'd waited for a woman cardiothoracic surgeon to go talk to, <laughs> I wouldn't be here. So, so I think that's what's really important about this. Okay? So I met people like that to teach me how to embrace a challenge. Okay? So I'm stronger now. I mean, showing up at Brigham, they hadn't had a woman cardiothoracic surgeon in their residency program before. You just do it. And you keep moving along. And it was really great. It was a wonderful opportunity and a great experience. I'm stronger for it. I'm a little more versatile. I have a better sense of who I am. But there are days that are hard, and you have to have the people to say, no, you're getting back in the bus. Okay? And that's what we have to give. Resilience is what we need to build in to women to do these jobs. So I find I make the most contribution by being different and unique. And my house is going to be different than anyone else's. For those of you who haven't seen Falling Water in just outside of Pittsburgh, where I did my residency, my general surgery residency, um, the water runs through the house. It's different thought about how you do a waterfall. It runs through your house. Maybe that works for you. Maybe it doesn't. If you want a gym in the basement, it's not going to work. <laughs> so I have all these tools, and I have all this, um, these dreams of what I want to do. But how do you put it together? I've got this broad purpose, but how do I make that purpose take shape? It's not something that you know when you're in high school. It's something that develops. And the reality is I didn't actually kind of have it completely figured out. I had the PhD. I had all this stuff. But I didn't find out that true purpose of what it means to me probably until the last 10 years or so. All right? So I start looking around. I'm looking at all these patients that I'm treating. I'm a real surgeon now. I have, as my mom says, you finally have a day job. <laughs> um, and, and, and I start to ask questions. I ask, what if? What if you're a 56-year-old woman and you have two kids and you had a cold that just didn't go away and so you get a chest x-ray? What if you're 43 years old and you had a chest x-ray because you hurt your knee and you need to have it fixed? And what if they tell you there's a spot on the chest x-ray? And what if you're in the office and the doctor comes in and tells you the biopsy shows it's cancer? What if they tell you it's lung cancer? What do you think that's like being the person in the other chair? And that's what I started to think about. So then what if the doctor comes in and tells you, well, lung cancer is the number one cause of death in women and men in this country. And it actually kills about 1.5 million people in the world every year. And then you start to think about it and you find out that actually more women are dying from lung cancer than breast, ovarian, and uterine cancer combined every year. All of a sudden, your world's totally different, OK? What if the doctor tells you that if the nodes are involved, the likelihood that you're going to be here five years from now, that the odds are that you won't be here in five years? You're thinking you got two kids, and you're thinking you were going to go play tennis. These are, my, these are game changers for these people. These are people we have to change life for. So what if then the response from society is, well, what did you expect? You smoked. When you didn't. And in fact, 20 to 25% of women never smoked and still get this disease. But society doesn't act any differently. So I started to think to myself, whoa, wait a minute here. What if we can really change this? What if we can find out that actually women have different histology of their cancer? They actually have much better survival, and they're more likely to have tumor-specific gene mutations. What if we start to figure out how to treat them better? What if 
we actually decide that we can maybe cure them and actually remove less lung to do it? What if we can prevent node metastases? What if we can cure more patients? What if we can develop a women's lung cancer program where women aren't isolated because everyone thinks they're all smokers and no one wants to say that they have lung cancer? It's better to say you have cancer and think everyone thinks it's breast than it is to say it's lung. And what if we can put them together and let them fight together and have a community? And that's what the Women's Lung Cancer Program came out of. So I started looking at the surgical treatment of lung cancer and to try to decide what does that really mean. And if you look at, at, at our knowledge base, we don't know a lot, we know some, that if you completely take out the tumor, complete resection, we get the best survival. And we have essentially, I think I can point with this, right? You guys can see that? So you can do different kinds of operations. A wedge or a segment is just around the tumor itself, and you take a little piece of lung. Lobectomy is kind of where you take a true defined portion of the lung, so it, but it ends up being about half the lung. And a pneumonectomy is the whole lung on that side. So lobectomy is the standard of care. It takes 25% of your lung function. If you get a second one, that's a problem, All right? If you don't have good lung function for whatever reason, you can't tolerate that because you can't breathe. So some people can't tolerate that. And so we tend to do wedge resections, but then you have a higher rate of recurrence. So we got kind of this kind of rock and a hard place that we're stuck at. So survival in these patients are really limited by local recurrence of lymph node metastases and distant metastases. And so we clearly need new ways to do this. We need innovative therapies and ways to do drug delivery to address this recurrence rate. And I have a picture of a lung here with local tumor recurrence and regional lymph node metastases, just so you can see where, what I'm talking about. But the challenge is really to prevent local recurrence where we took it out, to prevent regional recurrence if it's more of a diffuse disease or certain types of lung cancer that are more diffuse, and to prevent lymph node metastases. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today because that's what we've been focused on. So how does this come about? So I'm in the operating room. I'm working with my division chief who had the good sense, I'll call it, to hire me in the first place. Um, and we're working together, and it's a woman who has this big tumor. And she can't tolerate a lobectomy, and so we're trying to wedge this out. And we're having a conversation about what her increased risk of recurrence is. And we don't have a great way of dealing with that. And so I look to him, kind of like calling up the cardiothoracic surgeon saying, hey, I think I want to do heart transplant. I look at him and I go, well, why don't we just put chemotherapy along the suture line and let it release there and kill all the cells that are left behind? And he stops and he looks at me. That's a pretty good idea. <laughs> Why don't you do that? And I think letting your imagination get in the way can change what you do. And I think having the courage to encourage someone to do something new, because he could have said to me, oh, that's stupid. And it would have stopped. The power of the word in what we tell our girls is really important. So that day, actually, after I have this conversation with Sugar Breaker in the OR, this engineering student comes into my office and has to have a senior project to graduate and kind of forgot about it until it's like tomorrow. <laughs> so he shows up and he says, you know, I, you got anything I can do? And so he has, he has a semester or the year, he has a senior year project. And so I tell him about this idea. And I'm thinking to myself, I have about $5,000 that a very generous family gave me because in honor of, a, a, of their wife, their mother, who fought for a very long time against locally advanced lung cancer. Very brave lady. It was really special money. So I talked with this guy, and we came up with the hypothesis that maybe we could locally do this. And we came up with drug looting films um, that we could hopefully apply different kinds of polymers. And you can see here where the surgical resection margin is. And so at the way where we take our staples and wedge this out, we could put on these films and the drug could go into the lung and these little red things here, they symbolize residual tumor cells and we could keep getting, sorry, we could keep getting release of chemotherapy that would then kill the tumor cells. We can put them in in all these little minimally invasive ways with little small incisions. It would work with what we currently have. And so we tried it. 
So we have animal models where we've actually taken it and done drone prim primary tumor, taken it out, and then either put in film or give drug to, um, to the mice. And when we look at it, what you see is that if we take animals, I'm going to try to do this not advance it. Can you see again? Here is if we give the films have no drug in them, or if we give this chemotherapy, which is the one we use most commonly, paclitaxel, either if we give it IV just like we normally would patients, okay, a little different because they're small, <laughs> um, or if you give it right at the site, they, all the tumors come back. But if we do it in a film loaded that releases it over a very long period of time so that it's always there as the tumor tries to divide, it's always getting it, almost none of those mice come back and it's the only group we get long-term survivors in. So we kind of tried to figure out why and it was pretty simple. Like I said, I don't do neutrinos. Um, so the films deliver a much higher dose locally. And so you can see the blue bar is how much drug is at the site where the tumor was at 10 days later, and it actually goes on for 60 days, versus when we gave the drug like you would systemically, like we currently do, almost none of it is there at 10 days. You get it real quick, and it's gone. Okay? So the chemotherapy delivery by films is local, high dose, but since it stays there, the other benefit is it's not going to your kidneys and everywhere else. You're not getting side effects. And so locally, we think it should be able to help right there, okay, right at the site. So based on this data, this initial $5,000 is now a four-year NIH grant for a million, okay? 5000 to a million. CIMIT, because I know they're here and I deserve it anyway, helped us on the way. It didn't go straight from five to a million. CIMIT's been very gracious and has given us money mostly to pay the student <laughs> and to do the next phases. So what happens to the student? Okay, the project does great. The student ends up staying an extra year, gets his master's degree, changes his career, goes to medical school, is now in a surgical residency. Okay? It's happened five times in my lab. We've taken people and they're all going into surgical residencies. So he found his passion, I found my passion, because it changed what I was doing mostly transplant at the time, which was good, but this is something that fits the engineer in me, it fits the purpose, it works for me. It's okay to change, okay? You gotta make sure you pay the bills, but it's okay to change. So people have given me these opportunities. The family who gave us the money to try. People that say, oh, you know, why don't you come stay, live at my house at Stanford while you do a cardiothoracic surgery rotation? I met her at a bus stop. You know, I drove her car. It was great, you know. But, I mean, you do those things and you just, you have to follow your heart and figure out what you can do, okay? Now, what's interesting about that is that the serendipity and giving a people a chance to amaze you is what's really important, okay? So here's the serendipity part. The other part of this that comes out of this is that student, since he stayed to do his master's, I'm on the thesis committee. So who do I meet? My, my collaborator, the best collaborator I'll probably ever have in my entire life, is Mark Reinstaff from BU, who's a polymer chemist. Now we've got somebody who probably understands neutrinos, somebody who's really smart, and someone who knows how to use it in what we need. And it's an amazingly powerful combination. Because now we sit and we have engineers, we have uh, polymer chemists, we have you know, surgeons, we have a, a wonderful working group. All serendipity. There's no way I would have met this guy otherwise, right? So we now have several patents together. Um, and we're working on getting the film into clinical trials probably about two, three years. So. Um, the, the other part of this is really to challenge yourself. <laughs> so, curing cancer. <laughs> so I'll read this. I'll read this side. If people can't get it, I'll get to it in a second. So, curing cancer doesn't seem much more crazy than saying you're sitting on a farm in Minnesota, and I think I'll go to Harvard and be a cardiothoracic surgeon. It's about as crazy, actually. Um, and so. 
It turned out to be a great experience, but you have to know your strengths and weaknesses. So this sign has the dog and it says, I make it to the fence in 2.8 seconds, can you? <laughs> My answer is I can make it in 2.7. That's all that matters, okay? And that's what you learn through challenge. You learn how fast it takes you to get to the fence, okay? And I think that that's really what you learn when you challenge yourself and go, go beyond what you think you could do. So one of the things that Mark Grindstaff and I have been working on then is we wanted a little bit harder of a challenge and something different to do. What about cancers that are more diffuse? And what about node metastases? And so the other part of our lab has really been working on a unique chemotherapy delivery mechanism via um, nanoparticles and looking at these nanoparticles, which actually can get inside tumor cells. And they are designed so that the pH change that happens in an endosome pH is about five, is what triggers the release of drug. It doesn't do it before it gets to where we want it to go. And that has been important, which I'll show you in a second. So it gets inside, expands inside the cell, releases the chemotherapy inside the cell, and can kill that tumor cell. So what was interesting about this when we looked at it is if we compared it with other nanoparticles that were kind of out there, here you see we have very quick rise in the amount of drug release very quickly. So that's okay as long as it's where you need it. If you're trying to get it to go to lymph nodes or you're trying to get it to go somewhere, most of the drug's gone before you've ever gotten it to where you want it. And so we've changed this so that if you look at it, ours, the dotted blue line is much slower and it's a much slower release over time. It takes about 24 hours to get the drug all out. But the blue line at the bottom is if the pH is 7.4. So if it's just at a normal pH, it doesn't release, and so it waits. And so that's what we've really been working on, a way to try to more specifically tailor what we want. And when we looked at this, we looked at these drug-loaded polymers. And in the blue line across the top, it shows us that nanoparticles without drug don't kill. They just sit there. But the other three lines are However you give the drug, you dump the drug in there, you put the drug in different kinds of nanoparticles, you put the drug in our nanoparticles, they all kill the tumor about the same. So our initial thoughts were, eh, okay, it's fancy, it didn't make any difference. You gotta believe and you gotta hang with it and you gotta try to, to, to keep persevering. And so we thought we'd try it in vivo. So we took luciferase labeled tumor cells because you can see them with bioluminescent imaging easy and you can find where all the tumor cells are and we injected them into abdomens, and we happened to use mesothelioma because it's more diffuse and it's a type of lung cancer, and that's what my boss does. So we took the nanoparticles and added them in at the same time and put them in, and then said, okay, what do we see? So what we see here is if we look at here on the control unloaded nanoparticles, if the controls where there's no drug, you get a lot of tumor, like you'd expect. But interestingly enough, when we looked at the paclitaxel expansile nanoparticle treated, almost none of those mice had any tumor at all. It was night and day. They kill the same in the dish, but they don't work the same in vivo. And then what we found was really interesting is the three middle bars are different kinds of nanoparticles, or where it says Pax IP. That is actually the drug we do, just like you were going to give drugs systemically. It doesn't work. Everyone tells us mesothelioma is resistant to this drug. Hmm, maybe it's not. Maybe it's how we give it, all right? So it really got us thinking about maybe we do have something here. Now, this was given at the same time, and you don't give patients tumor and drug, right? So we look to see what if we establish it and get the disease growing, and this works just the same in established disease, and you can see the two first panels are with controls, and the last one is with these expansile nanoparticles where we don't get tumor again. And the middle ones are what we would normally think of as therapy where we're giving drug the normal way. And at four weeks, they're already starting to escape that therapy and we're getting disease. This translates into survival with the same model. Again, here, what you see is you can see that the red line is the nanoparticles. It's the only one we get long-term survivors. Even if we give the same amount of drug, the same schedule, but it's not delivered that way, 
they all will eventually die because this is the percent survival. So it's down to like 10 or 20 percent survive if we treat them with what we thought was the right way to treat them. Nanoparticles, they work better. We've got to figure out why, but that's the point. So all great ideas and all superheroes have weaknesses. If you find a good one, marry them anyway. <laughs> okay? That goes for ideas and it goes for husbands. So I'm at, I come home, I'm thinking I'm pretty cool, right? We did a transplant today. You know, I'm coming home, it's like 8 o'clock at night or something. And I walk in and here's my husband in the kitchen with the girls. And I'm thinking, what's he doing? So I walk over and they've got this whole thing set up and they've got these tubes. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? We're making hydrogen. I said, what? And so he's got the water, and he's fed, has set up the electrolysis, and he's collecting the... I'm like, okay, all I did was a lung transplant. I'm not making hydrogen. So that exposure and letting your girls be exposed to that and realizing it's not all about you is really important. And you need to find those people and find that support. And that's how superheroes really work. I've got a good one. Um, the other thing about this is that this project is like a marriage. It's all about loyalty and perseverance. After the first in vitro studies, we could have said, no, it's not going to work. Move on. you got to decide if you believe in the project and then work on it and not quit right away. And it's really about that same perseverance. So why are we excited about these? Because this is what we've learned lately. These are tumor cells. The blue is the nucleus. The green are all the drug-loaded nanoparticles. What you see is that in 24 hours, the tumor cells are packed full of these nanoparticles. That's probably why it works a little better, because they really seem to get in there. Maybe that we think it's because they get bigger and expand, so they can't get out. So it traps the drug in. You can't clear it. Don't know that yet. That's our theory. The second really serendipity thing that happens is you see in the top image is our image of where the tumor is in this animal because it's luciferase labeled so we can find it. And when we look at the animal, if we use our nanoparticles and label them also with a fluorescent thing, what you see is there's a direct correlation. The nanoparticles, for whatever reason, hum and localize to these sites of tumor. Now they're just put in the belly, they're not put in the bloodstream to circulate because they tend to get taken out by spleen and liver, just like almost everyone that publishes that they home, the majority of them get taken out by liver and spleen. But if they're close to tumor and they can see tumor, they will go to it and they stay there for weeks. And they will be right there, and we know now from the previous picture that they get taken up, right? And lastly, what we see is that they actually migrate in the lymphatic system. And you can see on the far right picture where it's been injected with the red at the corner, it traffics up that pathway all the way to the triangle. And that shows, and then when we take those out, what we find is it goes to specific lymph nodes, not every lymph node. So it's following the pathway that the tumor cells would go. And why does this matter in, um, why does it matter in lung cancer? Is because occult nodal disease matters. Because what we know is that metastatic disease is hidden in the lymph nodes. And about 16% of patients that we told them their nodes were negative. We just couldn't see it. Um, if it's untreated, it increases their risk of recurrence. And it decreases their survival. And why it's so hard is because the lymphatic pathways from a lung tumor to the nodes are so variable that we have a tough time finding the location where it should be. And so we've got a clinical trial, actually, that's been funded by the NCI looking at near-infrared fluorescent trafficking, where we actually inject, if you look over here in the far right, you can inject this indocyanin green color around the um, tumor. You can't see it with your eye, but you can see it with the camera. And you can see in the next pane, you can see where the pathway goes, and it identifies a lymph node. And so we've been actually looking at the way we can identify the nodes that are at risk in vivo in patients by following their unique lymphatic pathways to identify what it is. Much like they do in breast cancer, we just haven't been able to do it in lung cancer. This is important because there was a great study that you could only do in China um, that if you took patients who had tumor and you gave them intravenous chemotherapy 
or you gave them chemotherapy around the tumor itself and measured how much chemotherapy got to the lymph nodes, the bottom red line is intravenous. You don't, it doesn't get to the lymph nodes to a very high degree. It gets cleared. But if you look at the blue line, it's markedly different how much gets there through the lymphatic system. And that's what we've been starting to look at because we really haven't looked at lymphatic drug delivery. So we wanted to know if we could target drug delivery to regional lymph nodes that are at risk for metastases and looking at a way to actually inject these nanoparticles around tumor. And then here I have a picture um, that it, it's a little movie that shows how fast these go. This is about three times fast, but you can see injecting the nanoparticles. You can see how quickly it goes down the lymphatics and it goes right to where the lymph nodes are at the base, it doesn't cover every one. It tells us which one is most likely to have tumor in it. And when we take it out, you can see that one site. And you can see that one node. You can look at it. And hopefully in the future, we don't have to take it out. We can let it stay there and kill any tumor that might be there and, and, and be sitting there. When we did this so far experimentally, and we grow the tumor, and then we inject nanoparticles around the tumor, we find that that tumor decreases, but we also went and looked at the lymph nodes. And you can see here is a histology figure where all the blue dots are the cells within the lymph node, and all the red dots, because I've labeled the nanoparticles with rhodamine, are all the, are all the nanoparticles that have gotten into the lymph node itself. And so you can see there's a lot of drug that's gotten to those lymph nodes. And when we looked at it with drug-loaded nanoparticles and looked to see where they are, they're in the sinusoids of the lymph nodes, which are the area that we tend to find micrometastases hiding in most often. So we're kind of starting to match up what we want where. What was really exciting and where we started to figure out maybe we were onto something is that if you look at the lymph node metastases rates of all those animals I talked to you about, and you look at um, who got lymph node metastases and who didn't, the only one to significantly decrease the amount of lymph node metastases you get is on the blue bar at the far end, which are the paclitaxel loaded expansile nanoparticles. So they actually do migrate and deliver drug and seem to decrease the amount of metastases. Giving the same amount of drug, even around the site, doesn't have the same effect. So there's something different about how we're trafficking those. So sometimes your dreams come true. Sometimes you don't recognize they're coming true. And you just kind of have to hang on to it. So my last little story here is that I'm sitting at the dinner table. It's towards the end of my residency. And you're kind of wondering why you're doing all this. I mean, it's a long day. And you know, you're the only girl in the service and you know the whole thing. And my daughter it sits down. She's like four. And we hadn't lived very long in our house. And she goes, um, Mom, I have to tell you something. I'm like, OK. She goes, the neighbors across the street are really strange. <laughs> and I'm looking at her, and I'm like, oh, not today. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, what do you mean? And I'm thinking, you know, like they're naked half the time. You know, I'm thinking all these terrible things, like I don't know who these people are. And, and, and she looks at me, and she goes, well, it's really strange. And I go, OK, yeah, go ahead, tell me. She goes, the mom cooks dinner every day. <laughs> And, and she goes, and, and I think the dad's a doctor. <laughs> so my husband and I are sitting here looking at them. And my husband, he, he's great. There are families like that, dear. <laughs> I knew we were on to something. It's like the nanoparticles. You know it's going to work when you can get to the exception is what we think of as the normal. So dreams become reality. What we're working on is this idea of local release can prevent tumor recurrence and growth. That these nanoparticles seem to also work on established tumor. And probably more importantly, that the lymphatic pathways from tumors may allow us to actually think about doing lymphatic node targeting with some sort of drug and to actually start targeting the appropriate places for lymph node metastases. And it may be due to the fact that we can make things be more tumor specific and target tumors and actually get tumor focused drug delivery. I think the future, there's a lot of future. My hope is that we'll be able to get lower local recurrence rates with increased survival, decreased morbidity, that we can prevent lymph node metastases, that we can make smaller resections in the future. I'd rather not take out someone's whole lung or part of their lung because they need that. 
Okay, so you really want to do that, and to hopefully be able to lower healthcare costs. And it, that's not just lung cancer. We're doing working on trials for sarcoma and breast cancer, and we've got lots of different things that we can do. They all lymph nodes are very common. So, kind of in conclusion, this house building idea. Yeah, you got to have foundation, purpose, passion. You got to have some good tools. You got to be willing to change. You got to remodel your house once in a while. And passion and purpose should drive your choice not fame. Make it work for you. It won't look like you thought your house was going to look, but it might be perfect for you if you listen to what your purpose is. And serendipity, just like for this bird, plays a big role. There are lots of superheroes and heroes in training in my life, and these are listed only a few of them. Colson is my lab, obviously. Um, Padera is not really in my lab, but I've claimed him, so he's stuck with me. Um, Grindstaff has a number of wonderful scientists that work in his lab, and as I said, he's great. And Frangioni is from BI Deaconess, which is, um, does all the near-infrared work. And if you see, you got to re re reach out and we collaborate, and that becomes really important. And sometimes that's hard in some of the environments. I also have to say a quick thank you to all the organizations who've believed in this and have kept it going, and some very wonderful people some of whom I've mentioned here, Polly Vander Newt and James Gorman family, and the Women's Lung Cancer Program, of which some of the women are here, um, who've been big supporters and have kind of, with a little dollar here and a little dollar here, kept it going, that we're actually going to change some things. The last slide I want to leave is just one up that's uh, about finding a purpose, and I really believe this, that the finding, the purpose of life is to be useful, responsible, honorable, and compassionate. It's above all to matter, to count, <laughs> to stand for something and to have made a difference. And I think if that's what we instill, then the rest will follow. And then I have um, just the womenslungcancer.org. There's a website, or I'm happy to give cards to anyone. If somebody knows somebody who's kind of off by themselves and needs some support, we're happy to do that. And I want to thank all of you very much for being patient.